welcome everybody. We're going to give you a few moments to trickle in. Uh, I am really excited about talking a little bit about product-led growth today with the Mad Kudu folks and want to thank them for supporting this event with us. Uh, Francis will be moderating and guiding us through the discussion today. Uh, but while everybody is trickling in a bit of the traditional sort of what to expect here, um, use the chat panel, please. Let us know you can hear us. Uh, that would be great. And um, also, please use the Q&A tab. Audio is good. Thank you. Loud and clear. Thank you. Thank you. Um, please use the Q&A tab. It does help us stay a bit more organized. And if there is a chance to answer any of those Q&A questions live, we will absolutely do so. Uh, but if we need to come back and circle around afterwards, please expect that follow-up uh, after the event as well. Um, also, we're going to go ahead and open up a poll for everybody and just get a sense of how far along are you in your PLG process. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share the results live so we can see it coming through. And then as we get started here, we're just going to go around the table and do a quick round of introductions. And then uh, I'm going to hand the reins over to Francis, which is fantastic. And he's going to guide us through the rest of the discussion. So um, since I'm talking, I'll just wrap it up. I am Mike Rizzo. I'm the founder of the MoPros community, uh, now the official community of marketingops.com. And we are really excited to have you all here. If I haven't had a chance to meet you yet in the community, please come join us. It is free to do so in Slack uh, and a number of other ways. Um, so please come say hello and let's talk shop about marketing ops. And then I will hand it off to Francis. Hey everyone, and thanks uh, Mike for, for having us. I'm Francis, I'm the founder and CPO at Matt Kudu. Uh, and we're essentially a PLG platform that allows awesome folks like Peter at Lucid uh, on the MOP side to be able to help monetize and run smoothly PLG go-to-market motions without having to rely heavily on engineers for all the data crunching and data usage um, to provide the right kind of leads to the sales with the right kind of information to make sure um, the motion works smoothly. And... You want me to go now? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, so, hey, I'm MH Lines. We are very early on our PLG journey here at Stack Moxie. So, I'm here as much to learn as to share the experiences we've had um, going through the, the nascent things that we're dealing with. And then, Peter, if you could just do a quick hello and then we'll jump right in. Yeah, totally. Hey everyone, uh, I lead the marketing ops function at Lucid and we've been doing PLG for a while, but excited to, to learn some things from this crew and from all of you. Awesome, thanks. Well, Francis, I think that's your cue. Um, how about these results? Interesting, right? Yeah, definitely uh, definitely super, uh, it's like super interesting to see like, I mean, kind of what we expect, right? A lot of people getting started, uh, quite a few already with a, um, with a motion, uh, and just overall, like a lot of people exploring and looking to add PLG, which I think is uh, a trend that we're going to see grow, um, this next year, I think with all the, all the talk about recession and trying to do more with less and a lot of companies showing that they can achieve great efficiencies with PLG. I think PLG is like one of the, the really, really hot topics, uh, even though it is, pretty difficult to run effectively. And I think that's why we're really super excited to have uh, Peter here uh, today because um, Lucid actually has a um, like really good uh, understanding of how to make PLG work, um, like millions of, of users and like multiple sales teams. So I think the, the goal today is really to um, kind of, you know, uh, dive into Peter's head and understand like as MOPS professionals, like what are some of the big changes that are happening um, with uh, with PLG and what does it mean as a as a MOPS professional and what are things that uh, that we can learn from the best? So maybe to, to kick things off, um, I think one of the, the biggest changes that I've seen, uh, at least with with PLG, is that the the typical rev ops stack isn't really built for um, um, for PLG, right? There's just like a huge amount of data. And one of the big things that we've seen is that 
the um, kind of source of truth when it comes to customer data has really shifted away from the MAP and even from the CRM and kind of now lives in some kind of data warehouse, like Snowflake being probably the prominent solution out there. Um, and so that generally leads to analytics having a big role in helping the, the go-to-market teams. And so one of the things that I think is super interesting about Lucid is that Peter works very closely um, with someone from the um, with the analytics team. And so maybe Peter, if you don't mind sharing a little bit about like what the kind of go to market stack what the tech stack kind of looks like on the go to market side, like where the data lives, who kind of like accesses it, how you do um, any of that and like how you collaborate with the, um, the analytics team. Yeah, totally. It's a, always a fun question. Um, I think, I think one thing worth mentioning is that our, our tech stack is ever evolving. Um, we've layered in some tools like mad kudu over the past few years, um, to really help us have more control, um, over the data that we're pushing into various go to market tools. Um, our core tech stack is uh, Salesforce and Marketo. And like Francis mentioned, we're, we're one of the many companies that uses Snowflake uh, as a data warehouse. Um, we, we use our core stack um, with a variety of different sort of modern data stack tools. Um, I mentioned Mad Kudu. We're also using tools like High Touch um, to really help us uh, like model and push data in a scalable way into those tools and sort of like mold our core tools um, to match our PLG use case. There really aren't that many tools, at least at this point. I know Inflection is, is uh, making some waves uh, trying to replace Marketo, um, but there really aren't tools that allow us um, at this point to, um, to move with uh, our PLG motion and really leverage all the data that we have in our data warehouse. So we're using all of these, these different uh, I'll say like hacky solutions, even though they're sophisticated, um, to really like make our tools do what we want them to do. <clears throat> that makes sense. And so, um, so the stack kind of like source of truth, Snowflake, and then execution on the uh, Marketo and Salesforce. And um, you folks also have like subsets of. Um, the users in Salesforce subsets, uh, sorry, like Salesforce is kind of the smallest subset. Marketo is a bigger subset. And then Snowflake is like the full uh, list of users, right? So it means that even from a marketing perspective, if you want to be able to address like full lifecycle marketing for everyone, you have to be able to um, run on like or run campaigns for people that live in that uh, um, in that data warehouse. Yeah, exactly. Uh, we've we've gone through a lot, and we'll continue to go through a lot of like Venn diagram exercises where we uh, we look at who is in each platform, what the overlap between those audiences are, and what characteristics um, there are present in some of those different audiences. Um, like you mentioned, we have all of our data on Snowflake; it's our source of truth. Um, but then we need to figure out who we should sync into a tool like Salesforce, who we should sync into a tool like Marketo, um, and who we should sync into like all of our other various tools um, in a way that uh, will really help us scale over time. Um, so those those two like main audience syncs are ever evolving, and we just need to figure out on an ongoing basis who do we reach out to uh, from a marketing perspective, who do we reach out to uh on the sales side what the overlap is there and how we can get the most value from that overlap that makes sense and and maybe mike i'm curious because uh like there there's a lot of channels on the in the mops pro community around different tools like hubspot eloqua marketo i'm curious like are you seeing any kind of changes in terms of, like one of these and i actually forgot uh beautiful pardot, but uh, maybe intentional. <laughs> um, I, I'm curious, like, are, are you seeing any- It doesn't uh, even have that name anymore, so it's okay. <laughs> that's true. Actually. Uh, are you seeing any of those tools kind of like gain more traction um, with the PLG community um, in potentially like, you know, stronger ability to deal with higher volumes or like better integration with other parts of the, uh, the modern data stack? You know, I, to be fair, um... 
No, I I haven't seen. I mean, PLG as you know, as as buzzwordy as it is, it really is important, right? And um, I personally had tried to tackle a little bit of this, like you know, in, integration between marketing ops and the engineering and the product team in a in a past life at Mavenlink, and um, and it was hard. <laughs> We were using HubSpot back then. Um, we were syncing data from our own integration about plan types and trial start dates and end dates. And we were running our nurture onboarding sequence from HubSpot. And then similar to you, Peter, we were keeping some data out of Hub, out of Salesforce up until a point, like the MQL threshold, basically, uh, for fear of sales, you know, reaching out to someone that they shouldn't yet or something, right? Um, and because that never happens. Uh, but the, I, I haven't seen a big shift in the conversation around which tools are sort of leading the charge. I think, you know, Peter, you, you mentioned inflection. I think that's really interesting what they're working on. I think tools like Mad Kudu to support this effort is super, super interesting, um, but it's just complicated. And I haven't seen anybody really take a stance on why one platform, one marketing automation platform would be better than the other. Um, and I think that centralized source of data is probably the reason why, like uh, everybody sort of gave up on like your map being the central source of truth and shifted away from that because they realized, well, yeah, product data has got to come in. And then, you know, for some businesses, e-com too, and social data, you know, all this stuff had to be centralized in the one place. And that ended up becoming these, these platforms that we're talking about now. So it's a long way to say no, nothing yet, <laughs> but I do hope that, you know, we see more of it soon. Yeah. And image anything on, on your side that you see kind of through the, the different stacks that you're, you're interacting with. So we have the luxury of having literally every tool um, by having to integrate with every tool. Um, so I think it's critical that you have the advanced functionality. I mean, we talked about Pardot, right? The lack of the availability of webhooks makes um, pushing data real time challenging from the systems. So I, I think it's, you know, kind of the ability to do advanced coding functionality and pushing into that central source of truth. I also would argue that a central source of truth for most companies is BS. Like, I don't doubt that Lucid does it well, but the marketers still see Marketo as their central source of truth and the salespeople see Salesforce as their source of truth. If, even if there is from a data analytics perspective, a single source of truth, people are still going to like back into their, their version of the world and never acknowledge that there are two ships passing in the night. Like we're, we're doing it right now. Um, amplitude and snowflake, right. Um, trying to get it back into Salesforce so that as we're having QBRs with customers, what's the reporting so we can talk about um, upsell metrics and then being able to um, tag in salespeople when it makes sense. So it's it's just a constant problem for us, even though we in our minds have sources of truth. Yeah, that makes sense. I think the, at least from, from my vantage point, like what we see is definitely um, HubSpot and Mixpanel, uh, sorry, HubSpot and Marketo uh, leading the charge there with PLG uh, companies. We've actually seen a couple switch from HubSpot to Marketo, Marketo to HubSpot. Um, I think they're um, like the, the way they price, the way um, you're able to use them works pretty well. Um, so that's definitely like some of the, the tools that we see. Um, I know there was a couple questions around like CDPs and Pendo mix panel. I think the um, almost like the broader question and even uh, to, to MH's point, right? Like everyone is still, there's kind of what the serving layer, like I think we're, what we're seeing is that maps are being relegated to just an execution platform. Like what is going to be the best tool to run and execute campaigns? What is going to be the best tool to surface, mm -hmm. to do reporting for your uh, sales ops and your, um, and your VP of sales and forecasting? And there needs to be a bigger strategy in terms of where should the data flow? How do we build a system that we know can scale with our needs? And I know there was a question, like, for example, I think Pendo is, my personal opinion, a pretty terrible tool when it comes to the openness of it. I think it's great for what it does, which is like the in-app guidance and like some basic product, product analytics, but it, 
it plugs very poorly into the modern data stack compared to even a mixed panel, which is not necessarily the best, but at least you can easily have your engineering team push all the data into a data warehouse where from there uh, you can have um, teams like Peter's basically like use that data to figure out what we want to push to Salesforce, Marketo, HubSpot. And that's where I think the CDPs also have a, a model that I think unfortunately is bound to die in the near future because they're going to be replaced by the open model that Snowflake offers. And I know, um, actually, correct me if I'm wrong, Peter, but I do believe you folks use Segment or, or have used Segment and then like Snowflake is kind of the, has become really the the truth for, for all the product usage. Um, we, we use our own home built product tracking tool, which may be sort of a faux pas to say here. Uh, no. But that's just because we have like a really killer engineering team. So we make it work. Um, but we aren't using a tool like Segment right now. We're just using Snowflake. If anybody right. is here from Peter's team, snag that clip of the recording and send it to the engineers. They'll love you for it. <laughs> <laughs> they deserve kudos. <laughs> But it is true that from that standpoint, super interesting, like, and it's something that, that we see a lot, right? The folks who decide to implement like a segment or, or a mixed panel, it's more for the kind of simplicity of, of tracking more than it is for the functionality of being this like central data warehouse where you have all the data because ultimately engineers want to be able to query it. Like people want to be able to modify it. You want to be able to build custom reports in Looker or Tableau, whatever on top of it. And that's where like Snowflake seems to, um, again, like Snowflake or Redshift, but some data warehouse um, seems to make the uh, the absolute most sense. Yeah. I, and if I could just like add in this observation that I'm recalling from, from nearly a decade ago <laughs> when we were working on some of this PLG stuff at Mavenlink, um, I think it's really interesting to to work alongside these engineering and product teams um, to start with, I don't, it's a bit selfish of me to say, but start with what does the marketer need uh, in order to execute against campaigns? Because there's a lot of products out there, Lucid, Mavenlink, you name it, right? Where you end up getting first name, last name, and there's actually a profile in these SaaS, SaaS platforms, right? They have an existing profile database. And if you don't have built into that profile things like uh, maybe opt-in preferences or uh, you know the company name or some of that other stuff where you're encouraging your users to go complete those actions, I know that's not the primary goal, right? You, you want them to use your product. But if you don't really have that as a standard and you're not working alongside them, uh, this becomes even more difficult to start to try to pair up the data. Like email works great, but gosh, it'd be great if you also had the product sort of asking for a lot of the same data points that we're looking for, um, particularly in environments where you have, we have profiles and those kinds of things. So it's really interesting. I, it feels like a lot of these earlier companies that are coming up in SaaS now are starting to think this way. And then the hard part is like, how do you, how do you get these engineers to start thinking about like, well, why should I care? <laughs> why should I care about what the marketing team needs out of this product database, right? Uh, those conversations must be difficult. And it's, it's also that there's like a complete um, potential disconnect. Like this is something that uh, actually one of the, like a former uh, teammate of, of Peter who, who joined Mad Kudu keeps on uh, saying, right? When a lot of companies talk about uh, building this kind of system in-house rather than like leveraging a tool like a Mad Kudu or a combination of like stuff stitched together. And um, his argument is like, you know, if your engineers can name one AE, that they've interacted with in the past six months, then potentially they have a chance of understanding what they should be building. Mm -hmm. Like that's one of the big challenges, right? Engineers are building the product. They don't know what it is to be a seller. They don't know what it is to be an AE, like mining through Salesforce, looking at an account that has like 200 people active and trying to figure out who's the potential decision maker that I should be going after and what should I tell them? Um, and that's where, I think like one of the challenges with a lot of the, the modern data stack that, that we talk about is that it's built and designed for engineers um, with a very different purpose in mind than what uh, the go to market tools need to have. Like the whole thing about first name, last names, the concepts of account hierarchies and, and all that stuff. It's, it's very abstract to an engineer that hasn't been in the field trying to sell.
Mm-hmm. I would argue that that normalization, like I, I love what Matt Kudu is doing, like that that normalization that people can get used to seeing is critical as well. Because you don't want a salesperson, especially as you're a startup and you're scaling and you're hiring new people, you want them to come in and understand the tools and see what they're looking at and be able to accelerate quickly. Um, so if you're not showing them something that they're used to seeing, then there's a learning curve that's not necessary. Yeah. And and maybe this is a good segue to I think so. There's definitely like one challenge on the uh, on the on the tech stack side, and I think we're getting to a point where kind of the reference architecture is starting to uh, to show up out there. But there's a, another challenge from from the MOPS perspective, which is really like the sales adoption and sales enablement, right? Where it's like fairly straightforward in your typical kind of inbound motion, but now when we're talking about you know, again, like a product like Lucid, you're going to have hundreds of active users in an account. And now you have to figure out why do I surface this account to the rep? How do I help them figure out who to go after? Um, and, and more importantly, like, how do I help them understand, that, you know, potential conversion rate is not going to be as high as someone uh, raising their hand to, to talk to me. So uh, maybe Peter, on, on your side, I'm curious to hear how, I mean, I, this is constant work in progress, like sales and marketing alignment is in any case. But um, curious to hear maybe like some of the either horror stories or like recent successes that uh, you folks have had in getting the sales team to really buy into this um, sales assisted motion on top of a, a product led go to market. Yeah, I, I love this topic. Um, I think uh, I think I could start with a couple things. One. Um, one is that like when moving from an inbound only world where we're we're getting leads uh, like from chat or form submissions or even gated content leads, um, things that like we're all used to as as career marketers. Um, I think going from that world to also servicing PQLs, like you mentioned, Francis, can be really challenging. Um, and and we've done a few things to try and help bridge that gap. Um, we've been creating PQLs for years. Now we call them PQUs um, to better mesh with sales terminology. Um, so that's that's like one kind of nuanced change that we made. Is um, the U, at, sorry, Peter, is the U users? Product the qualified U users. users. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, cool. Call up. Um, where we're saying these aren't leads, these are good people that you should interact with. Um, which I, is like, again, so nuanced, but has, has really helped us out. Um, and we've also found that because these PQUs um, are rarely buyers, um, they are just like, they're generally like champions. They may be able to influence a deal. Um, they may be able to like help us connect with some of the right people on the account. Um, but because they're not the buyer, they convert at a much lower rate. And it's kind of hard for a sales rep to know what to do with one of these when we send them um, a PQU. So, um, so one thing that we've, we've done recently is categorizing uh, these users. So instead of just saying like, here, here's a PQU, ready, set, go, we're saying here is a PQU. Um, we either recommend or require outreach and then we also um, try and identify a play for them. Uh, so instead of, uh, instead of a rep needing to think through like, okay, I'm like running this play on this account and this user showed up, so maybe I should do this. Instead of saying like, if, uh, if this user has say like consolidation listed as a recommended play and you're trying to run a consolidation play, like boom, reach out to them. Um, just so it's, it's like way easier to identify how to work with these people instead of just sort of like shooting in the dark and, and just sending like a generic email to them. Yeah. I think Uh, there's a couple awesome comments in in the chat. The first one is, uh, hi Angela, by the way. Uh, but it's, uh, it's cool to say like people like the, the term PQU actually maybe like contrarian, uh, take here. Uh, I was talking to, um, I think it was um, Ashley at, at Asana. And, and one of the things she was mentioning is that there's what they started seeing is that there, there's actually like a complete blend. Oh, well, Ashley, hey, uh, <laughs> <laughs> between like all the like the sources of MQL. And basically what you start seeing is that 
the PQUs are also obviously interacting with like marketing content. And then it actually, you start having like these different sources of like PQLs and MQLs. And um, someone else mentioned recently that basically what they ended up doing was like completely killing the terminology PQL. Like there's just like a set of leads that we route to, to sales because other, otherwise there's this ex expectation is like only a product user. And it kind of like kills that nuance that the product users are interacting with content or interacting with the website and, and reps tend to only look at it from the perspective of it's just like um, just a product user. Um, at Lucid, do you folks have multiple um, like kind of lead uh, escalation processes to say someone could be like an MQL that's handed to sales, a PQU, uh, a hand raiser? How does that uh, does that work for you guys? We have a lot of complexity and we're we're actively trying to, to make it easier to think about um, by giving sales reps a framework. Um, so we actually distribute, I'll call them leads, even though it's like a mix of MQLs and PQs and some other stuff. Um, we distribute leads to probably about like 150 or 200 reps, um, which is a lot of, a lot of routing logic to understand. Um, but the, the reason why we do that um, is because we have sort of a tiered system. So any sort of inbound lead is going to get worked by a team of reps that move really fast um, and will hit our inbound SLAs, whereas PQUs are going to be worked um, either by someone that owns an account or someone that's setting uh, for an AE. Um, so they're a lot, they have like a lot closer proximity to understanding what's happening at the account level. Um, and then they can dig in there so they can start with accounts, um, understand where they're going to prioritize, um, using our account scoring infrastructure, okay. then they can dig into what PQUs do I have on these accounts and how do they fit in with the plays that I'm trying to use. That's Sorry, go ahead, MH. You go first. <laughs> no, no, I, <laughs> so many things, man. <laughs> <laughs> um, so how often are then if they're on the account side, how often are they using the plays and how often are they just kind of digging in um, to the accounts and then uh, kind of taking an, another leap and then reaching out? Do you know what uh, I mean? Yeah, I think so. Um, I'll say it, it depends on the, depends on the rep, depends on the team. Um, we're distributing these PQUs, um, like I said, to a ton of different reps that cover all global regions and all segments. So we're talking about like people that work like PQUs, uh, of people that work at companies with fewer than 200 employees or greater than like 50,000 employees. Um, but I think the. The magic uh, is um, how we're categorizing them. So, like, even though someone works at a fifty thousand person company, um, we can still surface what play they're probably going to fit into, and those plays are what are different between each one of these segments and global regions. Very cool. Okay. This is this yeah, is so, so sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say to, to actually answer your question. I think like. Uh, because it sort of depends on on like what rep owns what. Um, some like to start at the user level and be like, all right, here are all my PQUs, let's hit them up. Uh, and then other reps prefer to start at like the book level and then the account level and then get to the user level. So sort of depends, but we uh, give everyone options on how they work best. This is, um, th so what I'm hearing, <laughs> is a couple of things and, and maybe you could verify or validate or or, or, or reiterate peter um pqus it sounds like are almost just a status they're not a toss over the fence right so like he, out of all of the users these are the ones that are sort of product qualified users that doesn't it's not a signal that you need to start outreach now it's just informational so that as you begin to start outreach these are the ones that you might want to sort of prioritize is that what I'm hearing? Yeah, and it can be a little of both. We're, okay. uh, we're still trying to figure this out, like I mentioned. Okay. What we're going to try to do is say, like, here are some people that you should reach out to. And then we're also going to say, here are some people that you should reach out to if you find them 
uh, by digging through your accounts first. Mm-hmm. So we're trying to figure out like which which one uh, do our, our sales reps prefer um, and then probably invest more in whichever pans out the best. Super interesting. And then this, this raises, I think, like one of the common like uh, things about PLG is that um, and, and Francis, maybe maybe we were headed this direction and I've already forgotten, but uh, isn't PLG supposed to be like less sales handy, like hands on from sales, right? Isn't that the whole idea? Like the product sort of grows without so much hand holding from sales. Isn't that the normal way that people are sort of saying, well, isn't PLG just freemium and then you just grow from there? So it sounds like no, right? Like PLG is all about like taking this product level data and then engaging with sales. And even if you have a low dollar figure, like sales point, you're still factoring that in, I imagine, right, Peter? Like you guys are handing these PQUs over and and there's an ROI that's calculated. Like if you're paying a sales rep to hold hold hands on this account all the way through, it's super interesting. Right. But there's a lot of folks that like looked at PLG initially as like, oh, yeah, the product just sells itself. Like, that's not true, obviously. <laughs> yeah, totally. I think uh, I think that there are so many different overlapping motions. And like the really fun part about PLG is that um, is that like any action that you take isn't siloed. It isn't like we're a B2B company, so we'll do like B2B things and that will fuel growth. It's like we're a B2C to B company and we'll do something on the B2B side and that will make a change on the B2C side that will like multiply the impact of what we're doing. Mm. Um, so so like I think most people think about PLG as like being B2C but for B2B, but instead you can have like these like dual growth curves. I'm throwing out so much jargon, I apologize. <laughs> this but, is like, great. <laughs> But like you have a bunch of B2C growth and then on the back of that, you have a bunch of B2B growth. Um, And like those two growth curves, like have some really, really interesting interplay. Um, And that's kind of what we're like trying to feed off of with the PQU motion um, is like, how can we draft off of the B2C motion uh, to like get more value from the B2B motion than we could by really doing anything else. I love that. Thank you so much for indulging my crazy questions. <laughs> and, yeah, sorry. It's, so fun. <laughs> it's yeah, I think it's a, it's a pretty, uh, it's getting better, but there used to be a big misconception about PLG being self, uh, self-serve only. And I think uh, our friends at Atlassian kind of created a bit of that mythology by saying, Hey guys, we have no sales rep and we're like a multi billion dollar company. And it's just that they renamed, their uh sales people into like account managers or like product experts or whatever like yeah like we don't have sales no like, oh, well actually i mean you have people selling um the analogy i mean there's multiple things that in plg that i think are make it maybe more complicated than a traditional in inbound motion and you know looking at lucid i think is a is a really good example because you have multiple multiple funnels right you have this kind of like consumer approach like prosumer style funnel where it's like single users that will pay for um, Lucid Chart, potentially for some of the new products like Lucid Spark, whatever they, and there you have an adoption that's, it's a very single user play. That's a very specific funnel. It's a very specific style of adoption. You have smaller teams where it's more of a transactional sales motion. You might have a couple users who buy seats and then you have the more enterprise play where you know they're selling into these organizations that will have, hundreds and hundreds of users. And in that case, it's, you know, you can have, you'll have a bottom up approach where you're trying to figure out like, how do we get, you know, enterprise pipe from uh, product usage and from the huge amount of uh, users that we have within an account and how do we harvest that and how do we introduce, you know, enterprise level features and how do we educate the um, decision maker who's, as Peter said, and this is like one of the comments in there, the the decision maker, the buyer, however you want to call it, very, very often has no idea what Lucid is. They're not, they don't log into the product. They don't use it. Um, and for them, it's more a matter of like, how does Lucid help um, create better collaboration? How does it help 
the the team work better, but the buyer doesn't have any perspective on it. So I think that's like one of actually to Jeff's point, I think it's a fairly big mistake to only PQL buyers um, because you're going to restrict pretty dramatically the amount of accounts that you could promote to reps. But it does mean that you have to have a play where your reps know how to go after a champion, like Peter was saying, like someone who's like very active in the product. And how do you use that as an entry point into the account to then get access to the buyer? Because that champion alone is not going to be able to drive the um, the procurement process. Um, and yeah, the, the analogy I like to use on this is a lot of people view the storyline of like buying in PLG as something like very linear. It's like sign up, adoption, like value, multiple value, and then you convert. Um, I like to look at it as the, um, the storyline of the Lord of the Rings, where there's like one fellowship of the ring and there's like multiple stories and there's like people that have competing interests, like Boromir is trying to steal the ring for himself. That could be like, you know, the engineering team wanting to use another product. And, and like all of these have, you know, different roles and responsibilities. And yes, Frodo is the, the person who's going to like lead the, um, the initiative to an end, but he's not the instigator, right? Like he's not the one who started this, like Gandalf is that one. And he's like always in the background kind of helping, even though you don't see him. Uh, but if you take him out of the equation, then your storyline just like completely dies. And I think often we kind of look at this as a very consumer approach of like single user champion doing everything. And we kind of forget the complexity of B2B sales where there's like multiple people with competing interests, like, you know, compounding interests also at the same time. And there, that, that complexity of B2B sales and enterprise to sales still exists in, in PLG and actually has to be embraced rather than kind of Sean, I think. I would argue as I'm listening to you talk, I just want marketing operations people to hear, you know, you're talking about Gandalf and the buyer's journey. Um, but I would argue that marketing operations people are that Gandalf in the seller's journey, right? Like every single piece of this complexity is coming through a Peter Kirk to make this work. Like they are the nexus and everything is going everywhere else. So if it sounds important to a company, if it sounds complex, I, I want our marketing operations people to understand how critical they are in this story um, and that this is their hero story as they're thinking about this PLG journey. Um, because there is no... I, like you said, there's the mythology of Atlassian and Slack where things magically just happened, but that's <laughs> that to be mythology and not fact. Right. right. Um, so I would argue that um, with this sales piece and all of this product piece, this is where it comes together and this is where it becomes revenue for a company. Yeah. And, and I think that brings an interesting topic again. I'm, I'm going to quote like a story from, from Ashley at Asana where she was saying that, at Asana, they made the decision of having the SDRs roll into MOPS, uh, which I thought was pretty interesting, but does uh, kind of go to um, in line with what you were saying, right? That like MOPS plays this like really, really critical function of being able to understand like who's where in the journey and how do we help uh, most of the organizations get value from uh, from the product. And maybe this is like a good segue um, to me, the, the third part, right? We talked about the, the tech stack and how it's tricky in PLG. We talked about how to drive sales adoption. And maybe the last one that, um, last topic I wanted to, to bring up was the org chart, right? PLG, and I know there were questions about this, like should product own uh, tracking and inform marketing? Should marketing own it and inform um, product? And I think generally we see that PLG has historically been in, uh, in a growth team that, again, sometimes reports to products, sometimes to, um, to marketing. And they are, I think, some, some ways to make it work. And maybe I'd love to hear Peter, like, like I think if I remember correctly, you roll into the, uh, the growth organization and curious to hear your take on like why that potentially is like better than running, than rolling into a rev ops or into, um, yeah, like a standard marketing function. I think, um, well, one, one thing worth mentioning with our like true growth team, which we refer to as growth engineering, um, mm -hmm. they're actually in both marketing and uh, engineering, which is a, a fun little thing where product managers sit in marketing, engineers sit in the engineering org. Um, but yeah, marketing operations sits uh, within growth 
And um, I think one key benefit of that um, versus having us sit in the revenue operations org um, is really just proximity um, where we, we can be really tight uh, with our growth engineering team. We can be really tight with our marketing analytics team. Um, and we can really have all of the marketing context that we need to then go out and partner with all the teams that, that we need to um, to build things like our product qualified motion. Um, so I, I see that as the main advantage, um, but every, every company is different. It's like org charts are made of people. And uh, if, uh, if they weren't, then it would be like way easier to figure out how to, how to structure a marketing <laughs> <off> for it. <laughs> Uh, I love that. I once I once I mean, used a similar phrase for uh, when I was reporting into a client success division because uh, community happens to also report into random <laughs> random departments of all kinds. Um, but I once used a similar thing. It's like we were in the in the business of selling new seats, licenses, and I said, "Seats are people." I, I wasn't the only one that said that. We as a team said that. And, and that's the thing, right? Like you're selling to people at the end of the day, or you're organizing people with different talents and different skills, and it, it's complicated. <laughs> so just remember that. It's so funny. Yeah. What were you going to say, Mitch? Sorry, I cut you off again. I have no clue. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can say uh, just on that point that you were asking about a moment ago, Francis, um, in my experience as well, there was a growth engineering and growth team um, split very similarly to yours, Peter, uh, in my past life as well. So we had um, sort of this, uh, I think he, he at the time was the chief customer officer. Um, and, and then he was overseeing this division of growth that had a, a split of sort of product manager, product engineer, growth engineer, and then marketing, which at the time was only me. Um, <laughs> and we were trying to figure out how to make all that sort of work together, um, but it was very intentional, right? And it, it took that focus to try to figure out how to how to make that happen. Um, so it was a very similar similar organizational structure, at least for that SaaS organization uh, that I was in. I do love the idea of the SDR, uh, BDR kind of rolling into MOPS, however you choose to refer to that uh, role. Um, I think the reason that that got a really big head nod from me is just the amount of time that I spent uh, sitting alongside those folks, helping them try to understand what they were looking at, right? Um, hey, we passed all this data into Salesforce uh, about their interactions on the website. And how do you how, how do you start a conversation leveraging information that's like right there or like one click away? You know, how do you make that conversation happen? How do you make it easier? I think that makes a ton of sense um, to have that sort of recurring set of, of conversations happening. So it'd be interesting. I haven't seen a ton of orgs doing that, but I'd love to, to know which orgs are doing it so we could learn from them. I think yeah, you I think could the... make an argument that they could sit to sit with um, product if they're kind of answering that PQU and with demand gen and sales, like, you know, kind of the person that they're following up and not the person that they're handing the leads to, but the person that they're receiving from and validating from, I think is where this, the people should sit because they, the most important thing they're doing is getting good data back to the people who are sending them the leads. Well, and selling. That too. <laughs> and selling. And, and that's, uh, I, I think, think where, where when people are, when the teams are separated, I think the, the challenge there is that it's it's also what we're seeing with this blending of the this creation of the RevOps team, where I think we're we're trying like marketing is getting more and more uh, KPIs that are focused towards revenue because I think we we're kind of we've all seen the limits of um, like vanity metric based KPIs like hey like no, you're comped on the number of MQLs great and, and I think there's in in PLG especially we're talking about sales adoption and the complexity of enabling the um, the sales team and um, it takes a, either a lot of empathy from the MOPS team to understand how hard it is as, a, as an SDR, which again are typically like fairly junior people out of college trying to sell your product, trying to understand like how to mine through the account, like what, um, you know, what message to send and, and having that be a shared um, metric, like the number of meetings you booked and the amount of pipeline that you create, I think is, is very empowering for the, um, the MOPS team to have to figure out, okay, 
exactly what Peter was saying, right? We look at usage, we look at who they are. And based off of that, we try to determine what is the right sequence to put these people into? What are the right features to talk about? Like what should be their journey? Otherwise it very much becomes like, Hey, we're throwing stuff over the wall and now go figure it out. So I think that shared responsibility of enabling the team to be able to know what to mention is, um, is like a really strong value in having the, the SDRs and the, and the mops team um, report to the same, at least uh, objectives. I love how you said that in like a super positive way, as opposed to they're never going to dig in and do their hard work. So if you don't want them to send out generic messages, you need to really give them better information. So I, I appreciate that you said that in a nice way. <laughs> kind of related to that. Uh, one thing that that I've been grappling with a bit recently is, is just like rethinking what we should do as a marketing ops team, which sounds like the most basic question ever. Uh, but like, where do we think we can make an impact and what do we actually want to be doing? Um, which has led me sort of away from um, having a setter team be in the marketing ops org. Um, just cause like me personally and the folks on my team, um, I don't think that we would uh, like really uh, make a bigger impact on having these setters uh, like sell in the way we think they should instead of getting like the level of mentorship that they could in our existing sales org. So mm -hmm. I think personally, it, it just goes back to like, it really depends on what people you have at a company where I think for us, even though we have less control, um, having a tight partnership with a sales team is better for us than directly managing an SDR org. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. And, and maybe how, um, cause this is one of the, I mean, one of the most critical parts and, and very few organizations do this. How did you get to the realization that you needed to help them better figure out what sequence to put people into based on personas, based on behavior? Like how did that um, kind of come to life? Uh, a lot of time spent asking for feedback. Uh, we we kind of put ourselves out there a lot more um, than uh, I would say like I've done in previous roles um, where uh, we have as a, a marketing ops team and a demand gen team um, syncs with every single sales team that we support, um, which is a lot of time on the calendar. Um, but that's like a, a perfect venue for us to just be like very uh, vulnerable and transparent and just ask for that feedback. Because in calls like that, that's how we can start a conversation around any sort of innovation we need to make um, instead of just, just like kind of like watching metrics change over time and like reacting. Instead, we can be like really proactive by just regularly soliciting feedback um, and, and being like, honestly, like what feels to be way too open um, about receiving any sort of commentary from our sales reps. And, and is that mainly, because um, it's one thing, I mean, it's like the, the typical Henry Ford quote, right? If you listen to people, you give them a faster horse. Um, how, um, how do you then go like into prototyping or kind of like beyond? So I think the, maybe like the common thing that I see is to me, Mops is becoming more and more like a product manager role where sure there's like some technicality, you need to understand how the systems work, but more importantly, you need to understand uh, how the people that are going to be using your product uh, want to use it, right? And that's like, as uh, said in the chat, right? It's like, how do you serve best the the sellers? And so I'm curious how you went about taking that feedback and distilling it into ideas of things to ship and potentially prototyping it with a few reps before uh, releasing it to the world. Yeah, that's, that's a great call out with that quote. Um, as part of our process, um, we'll collect feedback if we really like if there's something that comes up a lot we'll dig in with specific reps um, that we know will give us very honest feedback um, and then we will just like try and distill 
all of the feedback we collect into like a couple key sort of like guiding principles. Um, so like one, one round we did um, recently was like um, PQUs are hard to work uh, because um, reps don't know what sequence to put them into. Um, and, <laughs> and, uh, and if they can't drop them into a sequence and they clearly couldn't work it. Yeah, totally. So we're, we're like <laughs> taking all this feedback, distilling it down and then thinking about like, what should we actually do about that feedback? Not just react immediately. So like, should we, should we like automate outreach from all these reps? Mm, probably not. Cause it's like, not really like our incentives aren't really aligned there. Uh, should we, um, I don't know, like tell reps exactly what to do. Like, eh, probably not. They don't like that. Uh, and so like found this middle ground of like, we should recommend, uh, a play for them. Um, and then they can, they can work PQs more easily. Um, so there's definitely, definitely a process of like being really open collecting as much insight as we can, and then eventually coming to a recommendation, um, and aligning all the teams that we partner with on that recommendation. I love the idea that there's, instead of like you know, kind of your entry level SDRs can be, is there a play? Is this the play? Right. And triage over to like senior SDR who can write one if there's not a sequence to drop it into. Like it's like a triage center instead of a, um, like it doesn't even have to be a salesperson, right? Like it's an analyst who's just saying, does this fit in this box? Or gosh, could you train a AI model um, to identify the right playbook and validate it? Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> no, <laughs> I, I think the validation piece is really interesting too, just in general, um, thinking about if you're making these recommendations and we're trying to assist, you know, you, you said something that I, I found particularly interesting, Peter, which is, you know, reps don't like to be told what to do. I would make the argument that there's a lot of times where they do want to be told what they can and can't say, but maybe not exactly when to say it. <laughs> Um, but so that's sort of the recommendation model, right? Um, and so here you are, you're making a recommendation of the play, but these are, these are learning moments for everybody. You're saying, Hey, I, I we're being intentional about feeling like really vulnerable, being super open for feedback. Um, and so we're learning from this and we're adapting as best we can in at the same time, these reps that we're trying to serve with these recommendations you're making on this PLG play, it's like, how do they learn from this? Why? You know, I, it would be really interesting to have that validation passed back your way that says, why did you choose that playbook? What, what triggered you to make that choice? And unfortunately, at the volume we're talking about, that's probably really complicated, I would imagine. But has that ever come up for you where you're saying, like, how could we learn why they chose that one? You know, if I had three in front of me, why, what made them choose that? It's just super yeah. interesting to me. Yeah, that can be tough. I mean, we, uh, we can look at like disqualification reasons, um, which can be open for interpretation. Um, we could always- uh, Whichever like, one was first. <laughs> Sorry, what was that? Whichever one was first on the Whichever one was first on the yeah. list. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, we could always track like what play did we recommend and then like how many of that category were attempted um, and then maybe dig in there. I think that there are just like so many ways to, to go about that, but ensuring that like we can at least learn um, from either feedback or from, uh, from like some automated insights, like, like we have to do at least one of those Mm -hmm. um, to be able to make improvements over time. Yeah, that's really cool. Do you track that? How many times they accept the recommended play? Um, we haven't started doing that yet. Um, we're I'm, I'm sort of like preempting some things that were yeah, we're that's able super to cool. Do, but uh, but yeah, we we may be able to do that in the future. Yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah, for me, the 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 part for me is like the psychology of it all, and trying to get the reps to 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 understand the decision tree and and thinking through the consultative sale. 
I, if I chose that path for them, there was a reason for that behavior. It wasn't because it was just teed up and I just selected it because it was the first in the drop down. And so that's, that's kind of what I was trying to figure out is like, how do we understand why they made that choice and then get them to fully adopt this line of thinking? Not that I'm good at it, <laughs> but if that's the dream state, like they just, they can just consult, right? Uh, that's really cool. So kudos to and you for thinking. One of the, stuff. One of the big things that we talked about uh, with Peter and that I, I know they have a, a big project on this uh, internally is you were talking about like reps um, want to be told what to do. I think that's so there's like an AI, we, there's police AI and buddy AI. Essentially police AI is it tells you this is what you should do. Buddy AI is like, hey, if you do this, it's in your best interest, which is the difference between a recommendation and um, like an obligation. And interestingly, what we see is that reps tend to adopt recommendations way more than they do uh, obligations. It's one of those reasons why sales SLAs are always met with a lot of pushback. Um, whereas like, I think Salesforce Einstein was like pretty cool in how it was designed. Um, like really make it like, hey, I'm your buddy. I'm here to help you surface stuff that you might not have thought about and things like that. And the whole idea then is how, <clears throat> you know, this buddy gets better because you're able to interact with it. And so having some kind of a feedback mechanism where the reps feel empowered to provide feedback that's going to be acted mm -hmm. upon it is really, really critical. I think that this is one of the challenges with MOPS and it's a topic that I could go on forever, but the, you know, the disqualification reasons are, are one of the worst fields I think we have in, in all of our Salesforce instances, because as a rep, right, like your goal is to, you know, make money at some point like so and for that to happen you need to meet quota for you to meet quota you need to focus time on the leads that are good and so like anytime you spend on potentially like giving more information if you're very like short-sighted it's going to be like this is like a waste of time why am i providing more information to marketing this lead is already gone i want to forget about it and focus on the next one if they don't see like oh but by giving this feedback i will get fewer bad ones in the future which will lead me to hit my quota more easily but I think that that feeling and that sense that there is a strong feedback loop is something that a lot of organizations struggle to materialize for the reps. Like they don't feel like sending this information back to Peter is actually going to lead them to a better future. Um, and I think that's where, again, like having the, the MOPS team be very open and potentially like, you know, going beyond the vulnerability, showing the vulnerability they're comfortable with helps get to that point of then there's velocity and iteration being able to say, hey, we heard your feedback. This is what we implemented. And now we're in a better state. It kind of creates this like virtuous cycle where people start providing more information and they really feel like we're there to, um, to serve them rather than just direct them uh, with what they should be doing. I also found cookies help. Like literally if you give people cookies. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm dead serious, yeah, right? Like. The SDRs are so beaten on and, and really are the lifeblood of so much of what we do. Like their touch matters and like bringing them cookies and saying like, I hear you, like your feedback actually matters to me. And it's about people, right? It's not about seats. It's about people and their people in the hall. Yep. Yep. I agree with that. Um, I was, I was, I, anyway, I agree with everything you said. I, I'm going to, we have like only a minute and 20 left. So I'm going to not ask my next question. <laughs> Uh, Francis, uh, any, any parting words of wisdom for us? Otherwise, I think we'll just, uh, give it a wrap here. Nothing. I think it was super helpful to, to hear, uh, Peter's, uh, journey and the awesome stuff they're doing at, at Lucid. Uh, like, I don't know if Peter, you want to advertise how people can reach out to you. Uh, but I, I think they definitely should. Uh, yeah, uh, there's a lot of good stuff that the team there is doing. Yeah, totally. Uh, feel free to hit me up on LinkedIn or in like the MoPros Slack community. Plug that. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I, I think there is a, a question from Richard. Um, I'll I'll ping you. Uh, I'll ping you in Slack. We can uh, get that one answered. Well, cool. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Francis, thanks for leading this discussion. And um, everybody, if you haven't had a chance, um, please follow Francis and the Mad Kudu team. They're doing some really cool stuff uh, as it relates to all of these topics we're talking about, MOPS, PLG, you name it. And thank you, Mad Kudu, and everyone for supporting the community. Um, and we'll go ahead and call it a wrap. We will share this recording with you. I promise. Uh, it's coming. All right. Bye, folks.